Huzzah. Thank you so much for having me here today. My book actually just released yesterday. So it is absolutely amazing to have my first talk here with you because I actually had my very first talk here with you after Susanna's Midnight Ride. So thank you. It's such an honor to be here today. And here we have uh, Dolly Madison in the War of 1812. And let's see, let me go to the next side. Here's a portrait of Dolly Madison. Now, how many of you associate Dolly Madison as the hostess with the mostess, right? That's what I had heard. And I had a friend, I was finishing up Susanna's Midnight Ride, and I had a friend invite me to go to a lecture at the Museum of History and Culture in Richmond on Dolly Madison. And I thought, oh gosh, you know, this is gonna be a snoozer. You know, just, you know, she was a nice lady and was a great hostess. And by the end of that lecture, I knew what my second book was gonna be. And it's just incredible, incredible lady. And um, I'll give you a little bit of background on Dolly. She was born uh, or grew up in Scotchtown outside of Richmond. And her father, her parents were Quakers. And after the Revolutionary War ended, her father decided to free the slaves because they were Quakers. And Quakers didn't believe in slavery. So he went to, they moved to Philadelphia, city of brotherly love, where you know, the, the Quaker capital. And he opened up a starch shop. And when I first read that, I thought, a starch shop? How are you going to make a go of that? Well, he didn't really make a go of it. it went into bankruptcy very quickly. And he was so depressed, he went to bed and basically died of depression two years later. So, very sad story. So, uh, at that point, Philadelphia was our temporary capital while Washington City was being built. So, Dolly's mother opened up a boarding house. As a woman back in those days, she had very few options. So she would take in different you know, VIP congressmen and senators who were in the area and, um, you know, and they were able to get by on that. So um, Dolly, when her father was on her deathbed, he asked her to marry this nice Quaker man. And she married him, but unfortunately, there was a horrific epidemic in 1793, and Dolly Madison's husband died, and her newborn son. She, she and her, her two-year-old, they survived. They both had this horrible disease, but they both recovered. So um, there she was, a widow at age 25. And lo and behold, she was the most eligible, you know, newly single woman in Philadelphia because she was so beautiful and so gregarious. And all these men were asking her out and James Madison saw her on the street and he asked his friend who happened to be living at the boarding house, can you introduce me to her? And, um, the best, as they say, is history. Can anybody guess who that who that person was who lived in the boarding house who introduced Dolly? Oh, Dolly's cousin here knows. Who, who was it? Aaron Burr. Aaron Burr, sir. Yes, it was Aaron Burr who introduced them. Um, so, but we really can't understand Dolly's role in our American history without understanding her second husband, James Madison, our fourth president. Now, James Madison, when they got married, James Madison was 42 years old. She was 25. And there she was, all these suitors, and they got married very quickly, within six months. And people were like, you're dating who? Like, because James Madison was 100 pounds soaking wet. She was voluptuous, plump, gorgeous, had everything going for her, and he was this little, People called him, uh, what it was it, shriveled Apple John, which I don't know what an Apple John is, but it's certainly not a compliment. So I mean, the people just, they kind of just dismissed him as a nerd, you know, a dweeb <laughs> for, for using a modern term. But um, so by the time Dolly met James, he was already an established founding father. He was very sickly as a child. So he never was able, he did not actually fight during the Revolutionary War, but basically armed with a quill, he was amazing and made much stronger contributions that way. So he's this tiny little man and not particularly good looking. He's 42 years old and the two of them just fell in love. And so at that point, 
Dolly had no formal education. She had done some Quaker schooling. And here you have James Madison, who had gone to Princeton University, back when it was College of New Jersey. He spoke six languages. He came from this, you know, Montpelier, very wealthy family. So they were just absolutely opposites in so many ways. So at this point, when they met, he was a congressman. He beat James Monroe. So he had already written the Virginia Plan, was father of the Constitution, architect of the Bill of Rights, and he was, he, and once he met Dolly, he became one of the leaders of the Democratic Republican Party. Um, so it really was crazy. And I love this um, term. And actually, the, when I went to that lecture at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture, the CEO of Montpelier used that expression that they were watching this first power couple because they were really a yin and yang. He was so intellectual. He was so smart. He was so kind. He was just a wonderful man, but unfortunately, even back then, it was a world full of, you know, what do you look like? So people loved Dolly, and in a lot of ways, she was his top political advisor, and she was able to fill in the holes. I mean, this man would rather stay home and read his books in Latin and Greek than go to a party, and Dolly would would be the last person to leave a party. So um, they were just a very um, unusual couple. And when I do school visits, I tell kids, like, this is what a marriage is all about, of people bringing out the best in each other and focusing on what each of, each of, each of you contribute rather than saying, you know, you're not social enough, you're not this or that. So um, just a, a, a wonderful story. But of course, people would say horrible things about James Madison, and they'd said that she, Dolly only married him because it would make her famous and blah, 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 you know, all, all that stuff. Um, very, very familiar. But um, so when James Madison took office, we were on the brink of war. He took over for um, Thomas Jefferson, who was the, um, our third president, who served two terms. And James Madison was his secretary of state for those eight years. So he knew what he was getting into. And basically, th there was a term called impressment. Are any of you familiar with the term impressment? Okay, I had never really heard about impressment, but basically the Napoleonic Wars were going on and the, the French and the British had been at war for about 15 years. And what the British were doing is they were basically taking all of our ships and impounding the whole ship and taking all of our sailors on the ships and forcing them to serve in the Royal Navy. So Jefferson, you know, basically Madison. Madison's always the worker bee. Jefferson gets all the accolades, you know, he gets the big shrine in Washington, D.C. There's nothing for Madison there. But um, so Madison, but he, he just was a very humble guy. He was happy to kind of be the man behind the scenes. So they had an embargo on British trade and all it did was cripple our own economy and it polarized America because at that point it was extremely regional. Everything and it's regional now, but even more so. I mean, this war was even more contentious than the Vietnam War. That's how bitter the divide was. So it's just um, amazing that the poor man didn't have a heart attack when he was being sworn in. And there's, you know, I saw some quotes from Thomas Jefferson. I'm kind of like, you know, he tells him, you know, the president, the presidency is splendid misery. Like, good luck to you. Um, so he was so happy that he. Uh, to leave office. So <laughs> um, part of the politics of the situation was that we had early Washington City. So the White House was only supposedly, quote unquote, finished in 1803. And the Adams family, you remember the show from the 70s, I always like that joke. But the um, Abigail and John Adams, they only lived in the president's house, as they called it back then. They only lived there for three months. And then Jefferson came in. Jefferson was a widower, and he really, he was very anti-monarchy, and he did not want to project anything that had to do with a monarchy. So he would answer the door, like, in his farmer clothes, and he'd have holes in his slippers, and, and he would only have dinner parties of people, of like-minded people, because he basically didn't want to deal with it. He was an introvert, which I never realized, it, it's the same as, as Madison was. In fact, both of them mailed their State of the Union addresses to Congress and never presented them in person. Just incredible. Yeah. Um, so so here, here they are, and this is the, uh, the president's house. 
and amazing that there's really nothing there. There's, you know, it's, it's, you can see all the way down the Potomac River quite easily. And back then they called it Wilderness City, and people were very divided on that because they felt like it was a waste of money. Why didn't we just keep the Capitol in Fort Alpia or New York before that? But it was basically part of a grand compromise um, that at the end of the Revolutionary War that, that, the, that the Washington City would be in a southern territory. So there's early Washington City. So when Dolly and James moved to Washington City, when he became the Secretary of State for Jefferson, they, their address was called Six Buildings. So if you wanted to write them a letter, you could write them a letter and you could say, Dolly and James Madison, Six Buildings, Washington City. And it would get there because there was nothing there. It was, they called it building, what was it? Uh, streets with no buildings and buildings with no streets. So they had this grand, somewhat grand, Pennsylvania Avenue, but there were no buildings on it. So where Dolly and James moved into when they first moved there, there was really no road there. So it didn't have a street address. And that's how small it was that the fact that it was just where six buildings stood together and that stood out, that was unique. So um, really just amazing of putting yourself back in what, what times were like back then before we kind of judge. Um, and basically on the streets there were just like kilns and brickyards and stones because Washington City was still under construction. And even Dolly Madison really was not sold on Washington City. I read some of her letters where she said, I wish we were still back in Philadelphia because there was really nothing there. So um, here's the early unfinished capital. And as you see, there was no dome. And that's a good thing because it would have been destroyed anyway. Um, but there were the two separate wings and the House of Representatives was, and both sides actually were absolutely gorgeous. And people believe that, that a House of Representatives was even more beautiful than the House of Lords in, in Britain and filled with mahogany furniture, just absolutely lovely. But as you can see, the outside is just barren. Washington City was a swamp and some still believe it's a swamp for good reason. Um, but it basically, Washington City was either a big mud pit or it was absolutely dry and dusty and during the summer. So we've got the uh, House of Representatives, or the Hall of Representatives, they call it, and then the Senate chamber on the other side. And back then, it included the Library of Congress, and the uh, Supreme Court was also in the same building. But if you look in between, there's nothing connecting the two buildings. There was just a small wooden walkway that connected the two, and that was the Congressional Outhouse. <laughs> so it's just amazing, really, to look back on those times. So, and the other thing that since there were no buildings there, we had all these congressmen and senators coming to Washington City and there was nowhere for them to live. There was nowhere for them to bring their families. So they had to leave their families home. So they slapped up these dilapidated boarding houses and put all these congressmen into basically dorms and they had a roommate and they argued all the time. And basically the only way to escape your roommate was to go to the outhouse. And we know what that house is. So it basically just bred more and more animosity because there was really no, nowhere to go in Washington City. There was no social outlet. There was nothing there. So, um, and we had, as I said, a, a very strong regional divide. So the New England states, the Northern states, they were Federalists. And they believed in a very strong federal government. They wanted a national bank. They wanted a standing army. Now, Jefferson and Madison, they were uh, from the other party, the Democratic Republicans. So they were called Republicans, but it has no affiliation with today's Republicans. So um, let's see. So um, let's see. I, I got myself distracted here. Um, um, so we had the statesmen from, but basically, Washington was against political parties. But if he had had to choose, he would have been a Federalist. And John Adams was a Federalist, John Quincy Adams, basically Daniel Webster, everyone from the Northeast. And um, they were called Doves because they were very much against the War of 1812 because they knew that their income was going to be decimated yet again by the shipping being cut off, you know, by being at war. And they're saying, 
well, that's not fair. You, you're these, you're agrarian farmers down in Virginia. You don't need to ship your goods anywhere. You're, we're the ones that are going to pay the price for it. So, I mean, I think they had a pretty good point. Um, and we'll soon find out that they were right about having a federal bank and about having a standing national army. And then the other party, the Democratic Republicans, had a faction, and they were called the Warhawks. And they were these young upstarts, most of them from the South, John Calhoun, Henry Clay from Kentucky. These people were, you know, wanted to avenge our honor, that how dare Great Britain treat us this way? We need to declare war. They were gung-ho. And Henry Clay was extremely charismatic. And he was not taking no for an answer. <laughs> And he was so charismatic, he was elected Speaker of the House on his first day in the House of Representatives. So he and his his buddies from the southern and the western states kept this drumbeat for war going. You know, just you know, they were on Madison. You know, you've got to declare war. We've got to save our honor. And then, of course, the Federalists are saying, "Look here, kids, you weren't even alive during the American Revolution, so you don't even know what war is." So are you willing, you know, we could lose our entire country over this. Are you, are, are we gonna, this is ridiculous. We don't, we don't have an army, we don't have a navy. You know, we had 17 ships and Britain had a thousand. It was like 30 to one odds. I mean, it was crazy. Um, so, and Madison was not a risk taker. He was not, um, you know, he, he was the type that really studied things through almost to a fault. So that's, that's really what Dolly was encountering, is she's got this introverted husband who really basically just wants to hide. And not that he wanted to hide, but um, he was not comfortable going out and, and speaking out. So, and there we are, and it's 1809 when he's sworn in, and she's basically got to launch a very silent, polite crusade to give, because to have the war declared, because there were, you know this had been going on. I mean, five thousand American sailors had been impressed, and it had been going on for years. And we really had no other option; they were not going to stop. So, um, let's see. This is what the president's house looked like when Dolly pulled up. Now, when she married James Madison, she was kicked out of the Quaker Church. So if you married someone who was not a Quaker, you were no longer a friend. You were removed from the church. So in a lot of ways, Dolly was very happy about that because she did not like wearing simple gray dresses. So she loved fashion, and she went hog wild crazy. So there's James Madison. He owns one black suit that he would wear every day. And she kept on him, trying to get him to wear long pants because it was the newest fashion. But he still dressed like a revolutionary, you know, with the britches and the tights and, and the, uh, you know, the buckled shoes. So Dolly, what was amazing about her is her sense of vision. Because once again, it's like hindsight's twenty twenty of looking back. But when you think about it, America at that point was only 23 years old. So that would be like our country had started when Bill Clinton was in his second term in office. So just how young we were. In a lot of ways, we had won the war, but we didn't know what to do with this country. This, you know, America is the, you know, the grand experiment, and we didn't know how to really how to set anything up because all we knew were monarchies, and we didn't want to be a monarchy. But Dolly Madison had a vision, and she knew that we needed some grandeur because here we have British and and French, um, you know, diplomats and. They're all reporting back, oh my God, the Washington City, it's disgusting. It's, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. So when she got to the president's house, she wanted to improve the rooms in there. And of course, James said, you know, oh my God, I mean, they're practically bankrupt. They had, you know, had no money and, and trying to save for the war. Well, she said, well, you have Henry Clay come, come here with his war hawk buddies who control the budget, and I'm going to show them around. And what she did was shame them and said, okay, the British have Buckingham Palace, the French have Versailles, and this is what we've got. Because Madison, uh, when Jefferson left office, he took, he had brought his own furniture up because he wanted to spend money on like a roof and like basic things for the house, the money that was allotted. So uh, when they entered the house, it was basically just 
a couple of old pieces of furniture that Abigail Adams had left behind. So it was basically empty. And because also uh, Jefferson had kind of turned it into a museum as well of artifacts and Lewis Clark. So that was all gone. So, so she had all these congressmen come in and said, you know, you wonder why the British are batting us around like, you know, a cat with a mouse? Look at this, this is embarrassing. So she basically shamed them and they gave her a $5,000 stipend and she um, hired Benjamin Latrobe to help her and they did all kinds of wonderful tricks and maneuvers and um, they, um, they decorated the entire room. This is what the room ended up looking like. It was actually the three front rooms, the dining room, the oval room, and then Dolly's parlor. But they came in under $5,000. So um, this is a famous portrait, but these um, drapes were, um, these red drapes that um, Benjamin Latrobe had said, oh no, you do not want these red velvet drapes. They're, they're gonna be horrible. And she insisted on it. So the, the lore is, it's not really proven, but people say that later on when the, the, um, when the uh, president's house was burned down, that she took the drapes and later on in life ended up making them into dresses. So, but whether that's true or not is, um, you know, between here and there. But she basically said, we're, our living quarters can stay rough. We're just gonna do the three flat rooms and I am gonna create a community in Washington City and I'm gonna invite everyone. She ran a ad in the newspaper that her uh, dolly, that the Wednesday evening drawing rooms would be from three to five. Well, what do you know, everybody showed up because there's nothing else to do. And it would be overflowing with people, overflowing to the point that people just had to squeeze in. So they became known as squeezes. <laughs> and um, so in her, whole idea was that we need in order to combat this division is we need to get each other know each other as people we need people to have a nice place to gather now this is the time of duels i mean there were duels in, in the hall of representatives there were you know it was crazy and people told her she was crazy and she said if you treat people well they will behave well and she had lovely food lots of alcohol she had the Marine Corps band, and she invited everyone because she wanted everyone to feel like the president's house was their house. So, of course, Henry Clay is invited, but so is his coachman. And everyone, as long as they wore their, you know, the best thing in their wardrobe, they were welcome to come. So they just kept getting more and more popular. And at first, some of the Federalists wanted to boycott it, and then they were like, why am I sitting in this ugly little room when I could go eat? you know, bonbons that, that, that Dolly's got. And um, and then when she ever saw it, when she saw people getting contentious, she would just send some drinks over them and send them slices of cake. And she found that people always behaved better if they were um, eating lovely food. So Madison, just hilarious. Madison was, you know, this tiny little guy and he's got his black suit on and, you know, not a looker. And he would just get pushed away in the crowd Nobody, they weren't there to see Dolly. So she started wearing these huge turbans on her head. And she wore these wonderful gowns from France. These, um, you know, the, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Empire waist dresses that were the new fashion. That, you know, this gauzy fabric, you know, totally getting people to get away from the hoop skirts and all of that stuff. And she ordered all her dresses from France. Well, well, she actually, she ordered these things. I love these little factoids, but she ordered these fashion dolls and they would send from Paris, they would send a little doll wearing a dress that was the latest fashion. And then she would give it to her dressmaker and have the dress made for her in her size. So she was known for her lovely gowns and basically everyone started to copy her. A lot of women would gossip about her because she gambled and she, you know, all, you know, she played cards and she did snuff, but she would just kill it with kindness. Like she, she knew people were saying things about her. She would go call on them, like a little calling card, and she'd leave it at their house if they weren't there. And she just would, she wouldn't go there. If someone was rude to her, if she overheard someone talking badly about her husband in her home at one of these squeezes, she would say, oh, you know, how are you? And how's your daughter? I've heard she was sick. Is she doing better? Like, and her, and she wasn't a gossip either. 
her idea was, or one of the quotes from her is that um, the secret to my happiness is not is not um, inquiring to other people's business. So she kind of just always took the high road on everything. And after a while, she would wear these people down. And she was so kind and so nice to everyone and so thoughtful that eventually people would come around. So she eventually would have these dove parties where she would invite a lot of the Federalist wives of Federalist politicians. And she would serve lovely food and her tea cake. And then she would say, oh, well, this is why, and she called him Jemmy. Now, this is why uh, Jemmy believes this and that. So she figured if she started to implement the agenda with the wives, the wives would go home and convince their husbands. So I'll leave that open there. Um, but, um, so she was very um, much more than a pretty face. I mean, she really was very shrewd. She knew what the confines of the culture were, and she worked within it and was just such a dynamo. Now, when they did move in, there was this portrait, life-size portrait of George Washington that was there. And it's an eight by 10, um, you know, extremely famous painting, even back then. And originally, that was one of their few spats. They had a spat because she wanted it in the big oval room. And uh, her husband wanted it in the dining room. And he said, you know, people can reflect on it and they'll be sitting there for dinner and they can look at it. And, and so, you know, he insisted, which was rare for him because she, a lot of ways, kind of wore the pants. And um, so it ended up being bolted to the wall because it was so big and so heavy. So there, there. Um, so she had that, and that was hung up in the um, in the dining room. And um, here's a couple of examples of how kind she was to her visitors. She would walk around with a copy of Don Quixote or Pride and Prejudice that were very popular then. And she would carry it around, and because people would be so nervous to see her, I mean, they just they were you know squeezing in there. They wanted to meet Dolly. They wanted to talk to her. So she would walk around and say, "Oh, have you read um, Don Quixote?" Uh, and if the person said no, she said, "Oh, well, I I haven't read it either. I just don't have time." But she had read it. So she just met people where they were, and um, so just amazing. And she also had a parrot named Polly. And she would, a huge macaw parrot, just absolutely way bigger than this. Um, but this was the biggest I could get on Amazon. But um, so she had Polly, and Polly was another conversation starter for people because that would get, it would make people relax, and she'd say, Oh, have you seen my lovely bird? And um, all of that. So she did all of this as a way to make people feel comfortable. And she just wanted people to have a good time. So one of my favorite stories about her at one of these squeezes is she saw a young man and he was really nervous and he was by himself and he was pressed up against the wall and she kept looking over at him and thinking, gosh, you know, I don't want to freak him out by going over there, but let's, you know, keep an eye on him for about a half an hour. And then she finally went over there and well, one of her servants was, was distributing coffee over there. So he had stepped forward to get some coffee. So she said, well, I'll just go over and um, say hi to him while he's getting the coffee. And he was so startled, he spilled the coffee, dropped the cup, and he took the saucer and like shoved it in his pocket. And she, and she said, oh, I'm so sorry. I must have jostled you. This crowd is so great. And just absolutely amazing. And she said, oh, I, I met your mother some years back. How is she doing? And you know, he lit right up and um, all that. And she said, I'll, you know, I'll have another cup of coffee. Uh, delivered to you, and, and then as she walked away, she saw in the corner of his eye that he took the saucer out and put it on the little side table. So just an amazing story of her kindness. And a lot of it goes back to her Quaker roots, which she credited for, is that believing that all people have an inner light, and that was a, that was a strong Quaker belief. And um, that's what she attributed. So here we are. There's all this build up, and the here comes the War of 1812. After months and months and months and months of debate on the and on the House and Senate floors, so this was very unusual. Not unusual now, of course, but Dolly would go to she would go to Congress and she would watch these debates. And normally, women did not go. She went every day, and she brought her posse. She brought you know a whole gaggle of of her friends, and if she was late, her friends would you know. Um, say the seat for her. 
she, you know, Henry Clay would stop and welcome her whenever she, you know, if she walked in late. So she really raised the profile of women as political figures. And because people were so infatuated with her, it was in a lot of ways just a very good distraction. And because obviously the Federalists hated her husband, but she just made herself so likable that it was impossible for people to hate her. So just, just amazing. Very simple concept that I wish more people would implement today. Um, so when war is finally declared, there are no Federalist, Federalist votes in favor. There, it's the narrowest margin in the history of our country in declaring war. The northern states go into mourning. They, they, take, they put their flags at half mast. They shutter their shops. They told their funeral bells, and they refused to send in their state militias. And of course, Madison's so weak, because we don't have a standing army, he can't even force them. So whereas the, the Western and the Southern states are celebrating, and they're setting off fireworks and illuminations, they're tolling all their bells, and um, just having parades. And um, but what does she do? She just keeps on keeping on. She really just kept on being kind, kept on visiting all these Federalist the political wives, kept on having her squeezes and having people come and um, you know delivering desserts if people looked like they were about to get into an argument. So the, um, the, uh, the um, Republicans called it um, our second war of independence, but the Federalists, they called it Mr. Madison's war. And obviously we're incredibly angry. So um, since I'm trying to focus on Dolly, I'm going to kind of fast fast forward. But um, basically, our army was a huge disappointment in invading Canada early on, and our navy really came through. And um, but one of Madison's many problems that really were no fault of his own is that there were very slim pickings for his cabinet, and basically they were all either uh, you know a frenemy, a drunk or uh, a liar, and some were all three. I mean, it, so he had this Secretary of War, Armstrong, who was absolutely obnoxious and so conceited, he would go behind Madison's back and do exactly opposite of what he, what he ordered. And he kept on saying, you know, the British aren't gonna come here. You know, it's this tiny little town, and they're gonna go to Baltimore. It's the third largest city. They call it a nest of pirates. Of course, you know, they're not gonna come here. And all the signs are, you know, pointing in the direction that they're coming. And, that they land in, on Chesapeake Bay, and thousands of these soldiers are marching towards Washington City. And basically, there are no preparations. People had believed him, and nobody had made evacuation plans. So just horrible. So they called up all the you know militiamen, you know all these men that you know fought the revolution, either had no experience whatsoever, or they had fought in the Revolutionary War like 30 years ago. So they ended up going forward to kind of meet them up in Bladensburg, just north of Washington City, right on the outskirts, trying to kind of, um, you know, 